These photos I took back in early 1992 on the west side of Heavy Tree Gap and uh, uh, I was up there one evening, um, mainly I was focusing my attention on just the road system that was in place at the time, there's proposals for changing it to a roundabout and all that sort of thing, but in the process of taking these snaps I uh, got some images where you can see some of the slope of the lower range there near Heavy Tree Gap and what's really distinctive about it is that the vegetation cover on the slope is comprised predominantly of scattered clumps of spinifex with native grasses filling up the gaps in between. So there's no sign at all of buffalo grass on the slopes of, uh, of the range there. Um, these photos I took in July of 1997 and uh, I was climbing up the slope and about halfway up I was thinking there's something a bit different. Um, I was assisting myself by grabbing clumps of grass to haul myself up slope and the penny dropped that literally the whole northern flank of the range was just smothered in buffalo grass. There was not a single clump of spinifex to be seen anywhere. This was the first occasion that I realised that something drastic had changed here. These uh, photos I took in 2000, uh, about February of that year. It was not long after we'd had some very heavy rain in the district and as a result there was a tremendous amount of uh, vegetative growth and here we can see quite obvious differences in the vegetation. The dark green clumps scattered around are the spinifex clumps and the lighter coloured grass much denser and more uniform in its distribution across the uh, the lower flanks of the range, that's buffalo grass. I was really puzzled by it because uh, the hill slopes were never intended for buffalo grass to be established upon and I understand that in fact it was thought it wouldn't establish on the hills. It wasn't until I was working at the Olive Pink Botanic Garden during most of the, uh, well, the decade of the noughties as they call it, I had to uh, introduce emergency uh, irrigation onto the grounds there during a couple of uh, years uh, because of drought conditions and that attracted uh, euros or hill kangaroos to uh, wherever there were patches of grass greening up and um, I encountered droppings or scats on the ground from which buffalo grass seedlings had emerged and they were growing very healthily and vigorous. The penny dropped that this is likely to be the mode of transport of buffalo grass seed right throughout the entire range system of Central Australia uh, as uh, hill kangaroos are a quite common species of uh, macropod. They're very agile and swift animals. It's quite likely that they are a vector of spread of um, viable bu buffalo grass seed through their scats or droppings and that opens up an entire new aspect to the uh, spread of buffalo grass in the natural environment which hasn't been given any consideration at all. That led me to uh, last year eventually getting around to collecting up a number of uh, scats just between town and the old telegraph station, uh, sowing them on top of a, a seed tray, irrigating them and watching what happened. And out of, I think it was something like 62 individual droppings, I got about half a dozen grass seedlings emerge. In this instance though, it was cooch grass and stinking love grass, but again they were exotic grasses. It remains to be seen uh, whether other macropods like uh, the rock wallabies or red kangaroos also do the same. Uh, if that's the case then what we've got here is a situation where the spread of this grass species is virtually uncontrollable and uh, we've really got to think very hard what the implications are for the natural environment as a result of that.